Hello, it's Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo again, a psychiatrist, eating disorder specialist. Uh, hopefully, if you've seen some of my other neuro series, and I hope you have before jumping into neuro series episode seven, you know by now my interest is in the neuroscience and neurobiology. And in this episode, we're going to discuss uh, anorexia nervosa. Uh, now, I only have a few studies in this, but in actuality, the uh, a lot of the research has been done with the neuroscience of eating disorders is actually with anorexia nervosa. And so that will keep popping up in the future episodes of this neuro series, as well as some of the past slides that I've kind of gone over. Again, just a brief review. If you want the details, you can go on Google and type up DSM-5 criteria for any of the eating disorders. But to just review anorexia nervosa, it's the restriction of food and energy intake relative to what someone requires for their daily functioning, and that leads to a significantly low body weight. We used to use specifically numbers of a BMI below 17, which is pretty much still in clinicians' heads, and appropriately so. But the DSM-5 has, has kind of eliminated a specific number. Uh, there's this intense fear of weight gain that goes with uh, anorexia nervosa, and one puts a lot of emphasis on, on how they feel in their body and the distress that's causing it. And, in, and, and, and there's a lot of behaviors that they can, again, engage in to maintain that low body weight. Um, uh, it can, there's uh, both two types, too. Some people think people with anorexia nervosa, all they do is kind of like not eat food and restrict their calories. There is actually a type of anorexia nervosa cause binge, binge purge type where people may, again, engage in binging and purging, uh, but then restrict uh, throughout the rest of their days or may actually engage in purging every meal, although it doesn't actually even involve a binge all the time. But oftentimes even eating the, a normal size meal in the mind of somebody with anorexia nervosa is thought of as a binge. So, uh, so there are different types of behaviors that associate with anorexia nervosa. Now, one of the things uh, it kind of goes back to when I was talking about children and adolescents, was was there may be some things that predispose somebody to to having an eating disorder and some brain changes that may pre-exist or may not recover afterwards. In this study, there's an area of the brain, you see it circled here, named ACC, which stands for the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, this is an interesting part of the brain. Uh, author Richard Restack, who wrote uh, the book uh, User's Guide to the Brain, I think, described it perfectly. He said, this is a region of the brain where heated emotions meets calm, cool rationality. And uh, you can see when somebody is really struggling with an eating disorder that there is this fight going on be try between trying to maintain that calm rationality and their heated emotions getting away, getting in their way, uh, fighting at times with each other. And that's something that people around them can see and notice. And so in this uh, study here, they find that this region of the ACC tends to, again, have decreased cellular volume. Uh, that may be leading to many of these disturbances. And when people were rate restored with anorexia nervosa, this, the, the cellular volume didn't seem, in most cases, to restore to its previous uh, baseline. Uh, there was no changes in, in the cellular volume. However, I will say that uh, since this study, I have read studies that have shown there seems to be some uh, restoration of this ACC region, which is important. Because what you do see with recovery, too, is you see that calm, cool rationality uh, kind of lift, uh, coming back to the individual and, and the heated emotions being much more well controlled. So, so in this slide right here, um, if you remember, I've showed this slide before that with someone who, who's walking around the world, you want your central nervous system firing off in a great way, all those neurons connecting. But with anorexia, you get this sluggish view of everything. And this hypo kind of metabolism that takes place can be related to both dietary nutritional intake, but also can be related to just the brain itself kind of falling apart, not producing that brain-derived neurotropic factor that I've talked about before, and also uh, being subject to increased cortisol levels, which can be neurotoxic. 
uh, this study just showed that they, the, if they could admit some, t- some testosterone to people with women with uh, anorexia nervosa, it seemed to help improve the um, hypometabolism and the functioning. But this is a useful study to understand the importance of, of hormones like testosterone, but it's not necessarily the solution. The solution always goes back to kind of restoring weight, restoring brain cells and their connections. And what we need to do is look at these types of studies to understand how changes in certain neurohormones, neurotransmitters, slow down the brain. And again, that's why I'd like to stay on this slide. I'd like to show it to people who are suffering so that they can conceptualize what's going on in their head. And those who really struggle with an eating disorder, when I see that hypometabolism taking place, they know how they feel. I think they actually know, yeah, I, I know my brain is doing this from time to time. So, so again, it's those things, like I said, uh, serum brain-derived neurotropic factor uh, is, is that protein that our body makes all on its own. And it kind of preserves how our brain functions and uh, it makes the cellular connections, those neurons, those little fingers and dendrites, it prevents them from withering away. But this, uh, uh, this BDNF uh, starts to get to low levels in people with anorexia, and it changes how, again, that slowing of the brain changes how they function cognitively, how they're processing the world, how they process themselves. Uh, and there seems to be um, uh, some restoration of the body starting to produce its own BDNF again when, when recovery is taking place and weight is restored. That's why weight restoration to me is not about a number on a scale. It's about what is the body now probably changing? What is it doing to help protect the brain and the central nervous system? A slide that I've now shown, I think, for the third time is just a reminder that we get the gray matter and the white matter volume loss, and that can equivalent to billions uh, of nerve cells and connections. Um, now, that leads to, again, changing the brain, changes in how one functions emotionally, how one can process the world, and this causes this destruction of one's quality of life. You know, I often, someone once said, well, what's the purpose of an eating disorder? And I said, well, the purpose is to kind of destroy your life. And in some people, that means it destroys their life physically, and they may not uh, live to their uh, full potential in a quality of life. And for other people, it can mean literally taking their life and taking them off this planet. And so anorexia nervosa is a very deadly disease if it's not treated properly. In this slide here, um, it's just a different region of the brain that I haven't shown yet. It's the hippocampus. And, and the hippocampus is it's a part of your limbic system. Uh, it's an area that it, it controls memory content, especially the emotional memory content. So many parts of your brain may help you remember where you were on your last birthday. It's the hippocampus that makes you remember how you felt and what your feelings were on that day. Um, it's also, you know, it's, it's important both short-term and long-term memory. Uh, and it it's big, plays a big role in spatial memory as well and spatial regulation. Uh, now, in studies like this, it shows you get a decreased volume of the hippocampus and a decreased functioning in that region. And people oftentimes, even with, I've read studies where with post-traumatic stress disorder, they've had up to 8% volume loss in this region, um, which is, uh, can have a significant impact on one, how, how one kind of remembers events, so, suffers through their tragedy and their traumas. And of course, as I mentioned in the child and adolescent slide, there's a high, very high incidence of trauma with eating disorders. So you may have changes in the hippocampal volume that took place uh, earlier in life that may have helped be something that precipitated the eating disorder, and it may be something that the eating disorder itself contributes to hippocampal volume loss and perpetuates the eating disorder. Um, and then you have, with the eating disorder, certain side effects like most people with an eating disorder have dysregulated sleep patterns, and the hippocampus is very involved in that as well. 
And we know that sleep loss also affects the functioning of the hippocampus. So um, in this study, again, it showed how there's the hippocampus amygdala formation in anorexia nervosa that has this decreased volume. And this area makes it especially vulnerable to, uh, to, to people going through stress. And the stress then, therefore, reduces that potential volume. Um, it also, as, as it's affected the hippocampus, it makes individuals perceived their stress as being even higher than those who, who may not have this type of uh, dysfunction taking place. I mentioned just like BDNF is a substance naturally produced by the body that helps us, uh, helps protect the central nervous system and the brain and the neurons. Cortisol is another substance that the body just naturally produces on its own. And it's really considered basically a very neurotoxic substance. I always say to my patients, you know, when you're under high levels of stress, when you're, when you're dealing with your eating disorder and the stress and distress that comes from that eating disorder, your body is often producing increased levels of cortisol. And it'd be like if I, if, if I was a um, psychiatrist who had cortisol tablets and I said, hey, why don't you take this cortisol tablet? It's neurotoxic. It'll cause a lot of problems to your, to your brain, body, and bone metabolism. Nobody's going to take it. You know, it's, it's always interesting that, that there are things the body can make on its own that are so toxic that you would never take as a medication. And oftentimes some people are afraid to take certain types of medications that are actually protective. But this study, in addition to it um, indicating how like cortisol can be neuro neurotoxic to the brain and central nervous system, it shows that there's effects on bone metabolism. And so it's very common for people to, to, to have osteopenia and osteoporosis secondary to having uh, their eating disorder be changing their hormones and changes in things like cortisol levels. So sometimes, you know, you, especially when somebody is young and was suffering with an eating disorder, you want to get baseline DEXA scans that kind of look for any changes in bone metabolism and osteopenia, osteoporosis. Uh, it, it's, it's really, again, the food remains the main component to try to put a halt on, on losing some of that bone mass and some studies, again, say if once you lose that bone mass, depending on when and where it takes place, it can be difficult to restore. So uh, it's just something to be aware of. And, and again, the hormone effects both in a positive fashion with BDNF and in kind of a, uh, a deleterious fashion with the cortisol that, that, that an eating disorder also has significant dependency on the healthy functioning of our neurohormone system. This study here, I always show this molecule to see who knows because I get worried if they do. Um, it's a cannabinoid molecule. Um, uh, and this study was interesting because I came across it shows low levels of the cannabinoid 1 receptor and females with uh, eating disorders is associated with risk cutting and impulsive injurious behavior. Uh, Self-harm is very high in the eating disorder population and as is self-medicating self -medication, self oneself. So a lot of times, you know, if I'm doing an intake and I'm, and I'm talking to somebody and uh, you know, I have to inquire about levels of self-harm, I'm often inquiring about and, and are you self-medicating, be that with uh, alcohol, marijuana, or other substances. And I will look at if someone is using marijuana and they are self-harming, I'm trying to understand that from a neuroreceptive view point of view saying, is that one of the things that's driving it and they're self-medicating? Is it something that I can maybe approach in another fashion or not? The only problem with using certain things, uh, in, in, in many states now mar mar medical marijuana is legal, it's, it's legal recreationally in other states, in some states it's not, it seems to be a trend that one day it will be legalized. But there are a lot of studies that come out and it shows the effects on adolescents. So, so people who are younger using marijuana, medical or otherwise recreational, or it can have significant effects on how a young person's brain continues to develop, and that's still under study. Another area that's under study with anorexia nervosa, with eating disorders, as well as with mood conditions, is this whole concept of our gut microbiota. What's the makeup of the, the bacteria that we have in our stomach? 
And it said that we have more bacteria in our stomach than we actually do human cells in our body. So, so a lot of studies are looking at what, what's going on with all these different bacteria and do they contribute to things like the onset of anorexia nervosa, binge eating disorder, even obesity, depression. And I would just caution everyone that at this point in 2021, the data is just still so new and preliminary. Now it's gathering more and more, but with the number, quantity, types of bacteria to say we need this balance or this one or that one, we don't have any evidence for that yet. It's still going to be an interesting realm. And, you know, technology does evolve fast. And there may be a significant role that the balance of bacteria in our system does play a significant contributing role in these types of disorders, as well as mental health and physical health. But the data is still um, just evolving. And I, and I just urge everyone to be cautious about reading or someone says, hey, I've got the treatment for you. We're going to change. Uh, we're going to give you this probiotic and, and we're going to give you these types of supplements to take because we know that we have to increase this level of gut. That's not found out at all yet. So just proceed cautiously with that. Now, I'm going to move on to a lot of the neurobiological and brain changes and things you see with body image in our next uh, neuro series, number eight. Uh, and this is probably as important with the treatment of eating disorders as anything else. Uh, how one sees oneself, how one thinks and feels about themselves, uh, how that, what they see when they look in a mirror, what others see when they look at them. We're going to cover a lot of that in our next neuro series, so I hope everyone will continue. Okay, and then I will see you next in neuro series eight.